Good to see you guys here. It's time for our announcement. So would you please open up your bulletin? And for those of you who have the app, I'd encourage you, you can just open up the app as well. And then I kind of beat you to it. I got the app open right here. If you don't already have the app, you can download it. It's Calvary Chapel East Anaheim. It is free on all app stores. So I encourage you to get this thing. Not only will you be able to engage with our announcements and all sign up and find information about things, but also you can follow along our sermon with interactive sermon notes and some great resources Pastor Bob has made available on this app, including some things to like develop a quiet time with God, how you study the Bible, etc. So I encourage you to please get the Calvary Chapel Anaheim app. I believe it would be very useful for you in your life here at Calvary Chapel. Uh, so here are a couple of things I want to highlight for you today. We have ballot measures overview next Sunday, October 13th, 1 p.m. in the main sanctuary. We review the ballot measures, and so therefore, if you want a Christian perspective on these things, you can come right here at 1 o'clock next Sunday for a overview on that. We also have a newcomer's luncheon. If you haven't been able to join us for one before, we'd love for you to be part of this one, whether you've been at this church for 10 days or 10 years. If you've never been a part of a newcomer's luncheon or dinner, we'd love for this one to be your first one. And for you to come on out and share a meal with us, we believe in the power of just breaking bread together as believers. And it's been amazing for me to meet so many of you guys and do ministry with you going forward. I've, there's a lot of people that I do ministry with today that I met on a day like this at a newcomer's luncheon. So I encourage you to be involved 
in this to see who God might connect you with and get connected to you as well. It's going to be on October 20th at 1.30 in the gymnasium. And we love we do RSVP for that on our app. Our hallelujah party is on October 31st, and it's happening from 5 o'clock to 9 p.m. At this point, we need volunteers to work a shift for the event, whether you want to pass out candy, run a little carnival game, or a big old hayride, something, something like that. We could use your help to serve our community. There's so many people at the, in this area that would never go to a church, but come to church every year for an event like this. And we encourage you to be those hands and feet of Jesus, to plant seeds of the gospel in people who might come into our party parking lot who would otherwise never for any other occasion. So we encourage you to not only be here to bless our body of believers here by putting on this event because it wouldn't be possible without that, but also for you to bless our community with the gospel. If you want to donate to the event by bringing candy, you can do so. There's bins all around our facility and you can just simply drop in your sealed candy into those bins if you'd like to donate toward that. We also have our Bless Fest, which is our Thanksgiving outreach. We bless those in our community, in our area who are currently struggling with or experiencing homelessness. And what we specifically do is we have reached out to specific homeless shelters and they bring in on buses people who are in those situations and we just give them blessings upon blessings. We have a Thanksgiving meal, we have clothing, we have optometry or dentist work. We have a bunch of ways to practically meet their needs, but also we are there to also meet their ultimate and spiritual need of the gospel. And therefore we share the gospel throughout the day in the gym as we serve Thanksgiving meals. And also just all of us together, as we welcome people into our facility, share the gospel. So we encourage you to be a part of it. It's a great family activity on Thanksgiving. And we love for you to be a part of serving the Lord. And it truly is more blessed to give than to receive, and I encourage you to experience that with us on Thanksgiving Day. Also on our app, we have released our seventh episode of Ask Pastor Bob. It's very, uh, it's, uh, the number of completion, we're not, we're not done yet, but it's a great uh, series we have going on. We have a variety of questions answered in this one. I believe we have a slide here of what questions are answered in this one. A variety of questions asked by you guys, and we're catching up. I think we're only 50 questions behind Pastor Bob, so we're, we're catching up. But you know what? We're, we're doing it. We're, we're enduring, and we're going to get there. So uh, thank you for submitting questions, and we hope that you are able to just be equipped better to know God and to make him known in this world through this show. Finally, we'll invite you out to our Next Step service. Every Wednesday night, we have a service right here in the main sanctuary where we worship and study God's Word, specifically the Old Testament. And we also want to invite you out to our dinner at 5.30 in our cafe in our beautiful courtyard. Kids under 12 eat for free. We have a bounce house out there as well. And if you are someone here, as I say all the time, if you, don't, if you live by faith but you don't eat by faith, you want to know what the menu is on Wednesday night, you can text CCEA to 714-695-9650 and we'll text you the menu every week along with also just happenings around our church. So that's all for my announcements. Now Pastor Bob. Thank you, Josh. Good morning. I do want to encourage you, uh, if you are not yet registered to vote, to do so. There is a way to uh, do that out at the table. Uh, I encourage you to vote in this coming election. You know, every election, I am told by those that are running, is the most important election of my life. Um, listen. None of those are the most important election of my life. The most important election of my life happened a long time ago from a different source. And I, I get more and more confident in our God no matter which way it turns out. I don't worry about that. I, I pray you're not fretting. But I do pray you take the responsibility. You go, oh, California's going blue. I already. This has nothing to do with what happens with the state and the electoral college in the state. It has to do with you being able to answer the question when you stand before God, what did you do with the privilege to vote? Did you, did you honor me by speaking up and taking advantage of that? He wants to say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Remember this, duty is ours, results are up to God. So be responsible. You say, well, how should I vote? That's something you and the Lord need to settle. And there's people in this room who are going to vote different. That's not my concern. My concern is that you vote your conscience, you vote your... You vote your Bible, and you know what the Word of God says about the issues. 
So I do want to encourage you, if you're not registered to vote, to take advantage of that. One other thing, if you got a text from me to give you money, uh, still not me, uh, that keeps happening. Some of you are, are, are telling me that you're getting those. So if uh, you do get something asking to talk to, text with me confidentially, because I want some gift cards for someone in need, that's not me. I'll never ask you for money. If you, if you fell into that, I hope you haven't. Come tell me so we finally have a, a report to the police so we have a, a victim. I think so far no one has fallen for it. Don't be the first. If you did, forgive me for being involved with your uh, victimhood. But uh, <laughs> like you to open your Bibles to Revelation 6. And if you're visiting, welcome. I'd love to meet you after the service. Revelation chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Then, John says, I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice of thunder, Come. I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a, a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. And when he had broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come. And another, a red horse, went out, and to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that men would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. And when he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a black horse. He who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand, and I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come, and I looked, and behold, an pale, an ashen horse, and he who sat on it had the name Death, and Hades was following with him. An authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, the famine, and pestilence, and by the wild beasts of the earth. Lord, as we um, now enter into the preview of what's yet in our future on this earth, we want to receive from you not only intel and briefing, but, Lord, we want the effect of why you are sharing it with John and the churches in the first century and all the centuries following to come to us. We need to understand why you're sharing this. We need the benefit, Lord, of it and not just the information of it. So open our eyes to see wonderful things from your truths. Lord, our hearts are stopped as we think about the amount of bloodshed that is in this earth's future, and we are so grateful to be followers of Jesus Christ in the days that we live. We do pray for the peace of Israel today, Lord. We pray for your protection against them and every unbeliever on every side of those battles. Lord, we pray for their salvation. You take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. How could we? You said pray for our enemies. Lord, we want to pray uh, for Israel's enemies today as well as the enemy of their own soul, their own belief. So, Lord, open us up to your spirit today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. You know, I, everybody wants to know the future. What's going to be the outcome of this election? What's going to be the outcome of these wars in Israel, just to give an example. But most of us care about the future. We think about our own future. We have been studying the book of Revelation in chapter 4 and 5, how we see this scene of incredible adoration in heaven. As the four living creatures are worshiping the Lord, and then the 24 elders, and then myriads and myriads and millions and millions of angels, and then every creature on the planet and in creation worships him. But we go from that incredible scene in chapter 5 that we studied last time of adoration, and we move into the most incredible scene of devastation and annihilation on planet Earth. Quite a contrast. 
You see, those who have come to receive Christ, to surrender their souls to the living God, have a, a future that's absolutely terrific. But those who absolutely refuse to do that have a future that is horrific. And that is what we're starting to study. In chapter 4, verse 1, we find ourselves transferred to heaven as John is caught up into heaven and we go right with him. Now, I've mentioned it before, but a reminder, the church is mentioned 19 times prior to chapter 4, verse 1. Chapters 2 and 3 are all about the message to the churches there in the first century. And we believe to the church throughout the ages because he said, let him who has ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. That's me and you right now still living in this church age. 19 times the church is mentioned. But after chapter 4, verse 1, the church is not mentioned again. Instead, we don't see the church. We see 24 elders who are redeemed, and I believe representing what had been the church. You see, when the church goes to heaven, it's no longer called the church. Did you know that? You see, um, when a woman gets married, when, when my wife now, Becky, married me, she changed where she was living and the name by which she was called. And so it is that the church, ecclesia in the Greek, the called out ones, the assembly, is the right term for the church on earth. But when the church is relocated into heaven, she becomes the bride of Christ. She's got a new location. She's got a new address, and she's, well, she's got a new address in terms of what we call her. She's no longer the church in heaven, but she is the bride of the Lamb. Chapter 5, we saw a scroll, and John was weeping as no one was worthy to open this seven-sealed Scroll, which we understand to represent the title deed of the universe, really, certainly the title deed of the earth. But then as John is weeping, one of the elders says to him, Stop weeping, for the lion of the tribe of Judah has overcome, and he alone is worthy to break the seals and basically redeem the earth. Christ, of course, paid the price on Calvary's cross for the sin of man. But the actual taking back of this world will happen through a series of judgments on a Christ-rejecting world. And each seal that is loosed in heaven will have a corresponding judgment that comes down upon the earth. Uh, the outline uh, of the seal judgments and their relationship to the rest of the book, I just want to put a little slide on the screen if we have it that shows the seven seals, each one being open. The seventh seal, when it's open, actually opens up seven trumpet judgments. And then after the, on the seventh trumpet judgment, we'll see that there are seven vials or bowls of judgments. And so there's a series and a series, almost like those little Russian dolls embedded in one another in terms of the judgments of God. And every time it seems like it's going to be over, it's not over. It just gets worse and more horrific as God judges man on earth. What I really believe is happening is as we see these releasing of seals, the Lord is simply releasing the consequences, the just consequences on man as a result of their rejection of God's Son. Put this down, if you will, at the beginning of our outline. The Lord calls us to see what's coming. The Lord wants us as believers to see what's coming. I see this all through Scripture. Put this down. The Lord communicates His plans to His servants. John called himself a bondservant. Amos 3 and verse 7 gives the principle, if you're taking verses, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless He reveals His secret counsel to His servants the prophets. God does this all through Scripture, that His servants, the prophets, are given the privilege of knowing what is going on or going to happen even in the future throughout the Scriptures. And really, He gives that information both because of the privilege that they have, their relationship to Him, and the protection that it affords them. Remember, God told Noah He was going to judge the earth. 
before he did, and that he needed to be prepared for that for his family. Abraham was told by the Lord, remember there in Genesis, that he was planning to go down and investigate what's going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. The, the cry of their wickedness had come up to him. Shall I hide from Abraham the things that I'm going to do? No, he won't, because you see, Abraham is a prophet. And so God will reveal to Abraham what his plans are. All through Scripture we see this, whether it's Daniel, who's beloved of the Lord, or the Old Testament prophets, or John the Beloved, God reveals his plans, particularly concerning judgment. 1 Chronicles 12 and verse 32 gives us a little insight into one of the tribes of Israel. And of the sons of Issachar, they were men who understood the times with knowledge of what Israel should do. And I believe that ought to be a description of every believer because God has revealed in the Word of God things He is planning to do so that we are not caught off guard. Because when you know something is about to happen might freak everybody else out. It shouldn't freak you out. And over and over again in the gospel, in particularly the gospel of John, Jesus tells his disciples, I am telling you what's going to happen in advance. So when it happens, you may believe so that you won't be stumbled when I get arrested. They still didn't understand. But Jesus said, remember, I told you these things in advance. Put this down. We need to recognize as a result of this who is in control Remember John, who's on the island of Patmos, and it looks like he's going to die there, and Rome is winning, is caught up into heaven, and the first thing that he sees is a throne. And God, that's the same thing true with Isaiah, the year King Uzziah died. We studied this, remember? It looks like there's this vacuum of leadership. Oh, no, God doesn't leave the throne. He's in full control. And in a time when it seems like the world is unraveling, spinning out of control which many times it feels like that in our world, doesn't it? Middle East is on fire. <laughs> we just need to remember it's always a control burn when it comes to the sovereignty of God. It's not Satan who breaks the seals. It's not man who's breaking the seals. The lamb does. There are four horses. They're called the four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, they're famous that way. Probably the background coming from the book of Zechariah, where we see four horses who represents, each horse represents a force for God's purposes on this earth. Four spirits in these cherubim calling out these works that are going to bring judgment on the earth. It's not nature going wild. In fact, each of these judgments has God's signature on them. Ezekiel 14 and verse 21. For thus says the Lord God, how much more when I send my four severe judgments against Jerusalem, the sword, famine, wild beasts, and plague to cut off man and beast from it. Hebrews 12 and verse 25. Hebrews 12 and verse 25 speaks of God warning from heaven and how man is responsible to hear God's warning. If God who warns from heaven, man, man better wake up. <laughs> Man's destiny is, is not to worry about global warming. It should be to open your ears to the global warning that God says of what's going to happen if you continue to reject me. Put this down. Christ colors in the outline that he's previously given. What do I mean by that? Well, John was one of the four disciples who sat in on that classified briefing on the Mount of Olives, what's commonly called the Olivet Discord of Matthew 24 and 25, when Jesus said, not one stone of this magnificent temple that Herod had rebuilt and restored, Solomon's temple had been destroyed, but this beautiful wonder of the world, not one stone will be left upon another. And the disciples were kind of freaked out by that. And so they asked the question, well, when, when is this going to happen? What will be the signs of your coming in the end of the age? And Jesus took Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, and he shared with them what would happen. So John sat in on that briefing 60 years prior to receiving this information here. So you need to write it down because it follows the same pattern. Matthew 24, verses 5 through 8. 
Jesus said this, For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. So first seal, we see a false Christ. And then after that, in verses 5 through 8, we see these other seals as well. He said, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Then that second seal, we'll see world war. And then he said there will be famines. That's the third seal, famine. And then pestilences and earthquakes in various places. And that's what we see in the fourth seal. In other words, we see this same pattern in the exact same order as Jesus revealed it to John so many years before. But now he is filling in the details. Put this down. First of all, we're going to see a coming counterfeit conqueror. In verses 1 and And two, the lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a loud voice of thunder, which is, thunder is that approaching storm, which refers to judgment come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer." The Antichrist will ride onto the world stage with a promise of peace. Now, many have suggested that this person, who's not identified directly in the text, is actually the Lord Jesus Christ. That is one interpretation of this passage. I, I have a real problem with that. Jesus is the one undoing the seal. He's definitely not the one riding the horse down on the earth at this point, but he sure seems like he could be to some because he's riding a white horse. It's true, the Roman generals, when they were given the triumph in Rome after a great battle, did ride with white horses. Heroes have always been associated with white horses they are to this day. Growing up, it was Ivanhoe for me. Some of you have never heard of him. That's okay. Uh, Lone Ranger, white horse, high-o silver. Yeah, so we think of white horses as the great hero or the victor. Well, this one will come with that kind of of nomenclature, that kind of history, that kind of a pattern of having victory. But it's interesting to me that while he is wearing a crown, it's not the diadem that Jesus wears, it is the Stephanus, it is the wreath of victory. And he's carrying here a bow, but there are no arrows. So some have suggested, and I think it's probably correct, not a military conquering but a world peace through political diplomacy. That's a perfect fit of what we read in Daniel. Daniel chapter 8, verses 23 through 25, speaks of this character. A king will arise insolent and skilled in intrigue. His power will be mighty, but not by his own power. And he will destroy to an extraordinary degree and prosper and perform his will. He will destroy mighty men and the holy people. As Daniel is describing this person that is called the beast later on, we think of him as the Antichrist. This man that will come on the scene, the the actual tribulation period, known as Jacob's trouble in the Old Testament, is a time where the world will first of all experience peace, which tells us that prior to that time, The world's going to be having struggles and conflicts all over the world, even like we see today. Paul Henry Spack, former Belgian prime minister, one of the principal architects of what has since its origin now become the European Union. His words are chillingly prophetic. Here's what he said, quote, We do not want another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of all people and to lift us out of the economic morass into which we are sinking. Send us such a man, and be he God or devil, we will receive him. You know, the Antichrist is going to come out of what we think of as the revived Roman Empire, out of the Western European Nations, nations today that you think of as the nations of NATO. And the fact is the Bible says that because 
God's people even, Israel, and the rest of the world have rejected Christ, they make themselves vulnerable to deception and actually delusion. But Jesus said this in John 5 and verse 43. It's a prophecy. In John 5 and verse 43, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another shall come in his own name, well, you will receive him. That is no doubt a reference to this coming one that we refer to as the Antichrist. You know, every candidate for president seems to have an answer to stop wars. I will stop this war. I, this war wouldn't have started if I was, you know, and to, all, and to end all future wars. That's politics, folks. Uh, remember Ronald Reagan and Nancy were walking through the cemetery and Nancy says, hey, Ronnie, come look at this gravestone. It says, here lies a politician and an honest man. And Ronald Reagan says, they buried two people there? <laughs> it's okay to believe a candidate's policies, but don't be deceived by a candidate's promises or their rhetoric. But when the Antichrist comes into the world, the world will be deceived into believing he's the answer as he brings about peace in places that we've never known it, especially the Middle East. He'll enter into a covenant with Israel, the Bible says, that'll be broken in the middle of the Great Tribulation. We'll study that more in depth in the days to come. But when he comes into the world, the world is going to think they're entering the millennium when they're actually entering the Great Tribulation. And by the way, not only will there be one beast, the Antichrist, which will bring about political unity and a one world government, one world monetary system, there is also another beast who we refer to as the false prophet who will unify the world at least spiritually or religiously. Very interesting to me. One world religion, you say it, wouldn't, it can never happen. I, I don't know if you've heard this quote, but uh, let's put the slide up on the screen of the... Pope, if we have it. Do we have that one, guys? Pope Francis? There it is. Listen to this. This was in Singapore. He said, all religions are paths to reach God. <laughs> they are to make a comparison like different languages, different dialects to get there. But God's, God is a God for everyone. If you start to fight saying, my religion is more important than yours, mine is true and yours isn't, well, where will this lead us? There is only one God, that's true, and each of us has a language to arrive at God. Some are Sheikh, Muslim, Hindu, Christians, they are different ways to God. You don't think that there is going to be a one world religion that's going to bring all people together and has a way to do so? It absolutely is right before us. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7 tells us why you do not know who the Antichrist is. By the way, People love to, well, do you think it could be? I think it might be. You know what? Don't bother with that. Stop looking for the Antichrist. Start expecting Jesus Christ. He's going to come on the scene first. And by the way, this horse, which I believe is, is carrying this conqueror of the Antichrist, doesn't come on the scene until John and the 24 elders are up in heaven. Here's what Paul says to the church at Thessalonica. You know what restrains this wicked one, the Antichrist, now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. You say, what's that talking about? I'm convinced that's a reference to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in the body of Christ here on earth. And Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. Salt prevents decay. It's like God, through his people, is holding back his judgments on this earth. He will not judge this earth until the righteous are taken. Remember what Peter said. Look at Noah. Noah's got to be safe in the ark. God puts him into the ark, shuts the door, seals him in there before the rain can even start. What did the angel say to Lot? Get out of the city. God's going to judge it. But we can do nothing until you're safe. That's the pattern. Peter says, that's, God knows how to handle this. He's got a good pattern and a history. You know how God works. And so we're not destined for wrath, but for obtaining salvation in Jesus Christ. So 
Paul says, listen, the Holy Spirit is not, by the way, when Christians say the Holy Spirit's going to be taken out of the earth, excuse me, the Holy Spirit's never going to be taken out of the earth. Thank God there's going to be millions of people saved during the Great Tribulation, and you cannot come to saving faith in Jesus Christ without the Holy Spirit. It's impossible. The Spirit of God is everywhere. Where can I flee from thy spirit? Nowhere. He's everywhere. But in his ministry through the church, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God. The Spirit of God is going to be removed. He is the one restraining evil in this world, holding back the forces of hell in this world, and God is going to take his bride home. And when he does that restraining influence, he who restrains will be taken out, and then all hell will break loose as Satan will be given permission on this earth. That's coming. And then the Antichrist will be revealed. Put this down. See the consequences of rebellion. Verses 3 through 8 really is the consequence of rebellion. Over and over again, we read in the Psalms, God will judge the world in righteousness. Now, I know people get upset about the fact that they read that God is going to judge the world as though the world doesn't deserve it. McGee said this, he said, many will say they don't like all this. He said, do you have a, a better suggestion as to how God should put down the rebellion on earth? If you do, would you pass it on to the Lord Jesus? How, how do you think he should put it down, this rebellion? Suppose he came like he did more than 1,900 years ago. Do you think man is ready in Moscow and the Kremlin to turn authority over to him? How about in any other country? How about in our country? He said, I'm telling you, they are not about to turn authority over to Christ in Washington, D.C. either. Neither of our political parties is interested in putting Jesus on the throne. They have some very unworthy candidates on both sides who would like to be on the throne. May I tell you, my friend, Christ alone is the one who is worthy. Amen. And that's true. Christ alone has the right you know, it was C.S. Lewis who said, there are only two kinds of people in the end, those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. D.L. Moody used to put it very simply, the elect are the whosoever wills, <laughs> and the non-elect are the whosoever wants. Interesting. The consequences of man and his rebellion. The Bible says the soul that sins will die. The wages of sin is death. We read that from the very beginning with the one choice that man made. The question isn't why does God judge people? The question is why hasn't he judged me yet? You read of Ananias and Sapphira lying and being struck dead. And you think, have you ever lied? Don't lie now. <laughs> the right of God to judge his creation is absolutely his, and it's always going to be a righteous judgment. In fact, the fact that God hasn't judged doesn't make his judgments unjust when he does. It makes him gracious that he hasn't judged yet. Um, remember what Peter said, don't think that God is slow about his promise about coming back and judging this earth. He's not slow. He's patient. He's not willing that any would perish but that all would come to eternal life. God is slow to anger. That's one of his characteristics. But that does not mean he will not judge. He must judge. In fact, he already has judged the sin of man on the cross. And if man rejects that, how shall we escape God's judgment if we neglect so great a salvation? There's nothing you have done that God hasn't forgiven, can't forgive, except that you reject the forgiveness. There is no forgiveness for that. So we see, first of all, put this down, a red horse. Put this down, this means war. And that's what it says in the text. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come, and another, a red horse, went out. And to him who sat on it, it was granted to take the peace from the earth. So the earth is experiencing peace. Remember what Paul says, When they cry peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come them, and they won't escape. And that men should slay one another... And a great sword was given to him. 
It was the war to end all wars. Well, that was World War I. I guess not. Called the Great War. It was after World War II that the United Nations was formed from what had been the League of Nations back in 1945. And this thought that somehow, man, if we could just get it together, if we could just bring all the nations together, we could solve the problems of mankind. You know what that is? That's the Tower of Babel. And it's happening again, and we'll study Babylon at the end of this book, which still exists in politics, in monetary things, and in religion. Robert Mueller has been called the philosopher of the United Nations and its prophet of hope. Mueller served the United Nations for 40 years, performed diplomatic missions all over the world. He served as the assistant secretary general to the United Nations. He was in charge of coordinating the work of 32 specialized agencies and world programs for the UN. He was one of the best informed men in the world. And Mueller was convinced, here's what he said, quote, there will be no third world war between the big powers. But instead, he said, we're headed for a new age and a new world, a new genesis, a true global, God-abiding, political, moral, and spiritual renaissance to make this planet at long last what it was always meant to be, the planet of God. Well, Mueller's dead, but uh, we haven't seen man be able to solve this world's problems. Um, I was watching... TV this last week. It was a, a live broadcast of the United Nations who was gathered to try to deal with the problems in the Middle East. I think we have a picture of that slide. This is uh, the UN uh, Security Council meeting on the Middle East crisis. And uh, I'll be honest with you, the reason I took this picture is because it looked like it said unsecurity. And I thought, that's exactly right. Somehow the United Nations thinks it's going to gather and produce security for our world. Oh, no, it's not. It never does as it condemns Israel for its attempts to protect itself. You know, Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. I'm sure you've heard this old saying. You're either going to know God and know peace or know God, no peace. Remember what it says there in Isaiah in that passage we usually quote at Christmas? It says, of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. But the, the verb increase has to go with both of them. Of the increase of the Lord's government, Jesus Christ, to the degree you let him govern, you'll have more peace. You want more peace? I always want, hey, give me more peace. I don't need my problem solved. I need peace. You know, if you have peace about the things that are going on in your life right now, you don't need the problems to change. Remember, we're to be given a peace that passes understanding. What that means is I can have peace even though it doesn't make sense. We all want peace that makes sense. I want this thing healed. I want this thing fixed. He wants to give you something more miraculous. He promises something more miraculous. How do I get it? Increase his government. Recognize he's in charge. Allow his will to become your will, even when you don't prefer it, like Jesus in the garden, if it possible, nevertheless, you make those your words about what you'd like to see him do, but what you're willing to say is, Lord, you have the right to edit every single one of my prayers, and I submit myself to your will. Increase his government, and you will see increased peace. Isaiah 57, 20 says this, but the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up refuse and mud. Where does the peace start for a person on this planet? In getting right with God. You might have a problem with your husband or your wife or your children or your parents or your boss or your mother-in-law or whoever, I don't know who it is. Paul says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. You're deceived into thinking that's who your enemy is, and you're not even fighting the right enemy. Actually, until this changes, your first enemy, believe it or not, you might call him the man upstairs that you're good with. Well, he's not good with you. Your sin has made you an enemy of God. But thank God, though you were his enemy, Jesus Christ died for you as his enemy. But you have to accept the pardon. You have to agree to the deal. When that happens by faith, 
then Romans 5, 1 is true. Having been justified by faith, we have, say it out loud, peace with God. One of Billy Graham's favorite books was his own, Peace with God, offers it to everybody. How can I be at peace with it? You don't even know you're at war with God. You have no idea. You don't think of it as being at war with God. You, you respect God. You think good of it. But until you accept his gift, until you ask forgiveness of your sins, God cannot give you peace. It starts there. You'll never know the peace of the Lord until you have peace with the Lord. Many of us in this room, you're Christians, you're born again, you have peace with God, praise God, but you're not enjoying peace with him because you're not surrendered. That's Philippians 4, 6 through 8. Prescription written out for a believer, how to have peace with, not just with God, but the peace of God in your circumstances. But this world who's rejected Christ, we will not have this man rule over us, knows no peace at all. Things are falling apart. Remember hearing the story of this dad. He was reading his newspaper, and his little boy wanted, he said, Daddy, I'm bored. I want to do something. Give me something to do. And finally, dad didn't know what to do. So he, he, he saw there was this <laughs> world map in the, in the newspaper. And his little boy, so he, he took out, the, the, he tore it out, and then he tore it in pieces. And uh, he said, just put it all back together, little pieces of world map. I knew his son could never figure that out, you know. A few seconds later, with scotch tape, the boy had brought it back. It was perfectly back in place. He goes, how did, how did you do that? My son's brilliant. He said, well, I couldn't figure it out. I turned it over. I remember there was a picture of Jesus on the other side. He said, all I did is put Jesus where he belonged in the map. The world came back all on its own. That's right. When are you going to let, when are you going to put Jesus where he belongs in your life? When are you going to not just say he's the Lord, but say he's my Lord, like Thomas had to say. Not just the Messiah, my Messiah, my anointed one. You're my king and my God. At that point in your life, your life will change. Your life will change. Will it be perfectly the way you think it should be? Oh, no, it'll be perfectly the way he intends it to be, which is not the way you necessarily always understand it to be. But that's when your world will start to experience a peace like you've never known. Put this down, then there's the black horse. And that's the famine that follows the war. In our text, in verse 5, when he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and look. Behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. We're talking economics now. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius. Don't hurt the oil and the wine. This is a description of what follows war historically and to our day, and especially as world wars break out. Soaring inflation and widespread starvation. One day's wage, that's the denarius, is going to cost or is going to provide enough for one person to supply the food that they need. That's the idea. A quart of wheat was enough for one man to eat. But at today's rate, it'd be like 200 and some dollars for that amount of food in the Great Tribulation. Food will be so scarce that you'll barely be able to enough to buy enough for one day's for one person. In other words, whereas it normally would have provided between 8 to 16 quarts for a whole family, plenty, during the Great Tribulation because of the effects of war and the famines that follow, there will not be enough for people to provide for themselves and their families or anybody else. Oil and wine are luxuries that even during the Great Tribulation and times of famine, well, they'll still be available. In other words, there's going to be great poverty and greater polarity between the rich and the poor. The rich will still have access the poor will have less and less of what they need. You know, um, governments are always committed to winning the war on poverty. Jesus said, the poor you'll always have with you. 
Now, don't get me wrong. He tells his people to care for the poor. This is pure and undefiled religion, visiting the, the, the widow in her need and having care for the poor is part of the way we demonstrate a love for the Lord. He who gives to the poor lends to the Lord and God will repay. But we will not win the war on poverty. War creates the poverty and greed. Uh, interesting, in 2019, the state of California spent $24 billion to end homelessness. We now have 30,000 more homeless in 2024 than we did before. Man will not solve that problem. But man's greed creates problems between him and man. That's James. Where cometh these wars among you? So not that you lust and you, you want and you, so you damage in relationships happens because of this internal desire of the flesh. But then also the outcome of that is a hunger that is never really satisfied. Put this down. Then there's the pale horse. There in our text, in verse 7, when the Lamb broke the fourth seal, I looked and behold an ashen horse, or a pale horse, and he who sat on it had the name Death. And Hades was following with him. And authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and famine and with disease or pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. Now in this fourth horse, we've seen war break out. The Antichrist unable to hold it all together. And then the repercussions of war, famine. And now we see death coming from a variety of sources, certainly from the sword of war, from the famines that follow, and from the diseases, the pestilences that come. It's like John sees death in Hades. He sees the grim reaper followed by the grave digger. See, death can only slay the body, but Hades swallows the soul. It's interesting. Do you know the Civil War? By the way, we had more losses uh, during the Civil War than all of our other wars put together. Of course, there were Americans on both sides of the battlefield. But during the Civil War, we had more deaths from disease than from the battlefield. World War I had 8.5 million people who died on this planet. But at the end of World War I, and many believe as a result of World War I, the Spanish flu in 1918 killed 100 million people. 56 million people die annually on planet Earth. If this were today, and I don't think it's very long off from now. We're talking about a quarter of the world's population. We are just at 8 billion people now. You can do the math. We're talking 2 billion people dying in the very early years of the middle of the Great Tribulation. We're talking about this happening within just probably a year to two years' time. They're going to be people dying everywhere. They're not going to be able to bury the bodies Disease will spread. You know, um, COVID now has claimed worldwide 7 million lives. We're talking about 400 times that number being killed in this fourth horseman coming out. Matthew 24 and verse 22, Jesus said it this way. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. Deaths from war, deaths from famine, deaths from pestilence, and also, very interesting in our text, I just want you to not uh, miss this, that he speaks also of wild beasts. There at the end of verse 8, do you see that? And also by the wild beasts of the earth. Very strange kind of a statement. You kind of, you know, some believe that the animals are just going to go crazy because of all the people that are dying and their lack of food, and they're going to be so hungry, they're going to just come after us. And I'm, I'm not sure that's really what it means. We're not told exactly how this is going to happen. But it is interesting to me that David in the Old Testament, in 2 Samuel 24, was told by God to choose his punishment. Remember, he had numbered the fighting men of Israel. He did a census because he wanted 
to know how strong he was, and God judged him for it. And then he was given a choice. How do you want me to punish you? I mean, the Lord doesn't often show up and tell us that, but David was given a choice, and God sent him a prophet to tell him to choose his punishment. Here are the choices. You can have famine for three years. You can have the sword of war with the Philistines for three months, or you can have pestilence for three days. It's interesting. The pestilence is called the sword of the Lord in the text. That's what he chose. I mean, not fall into the hands of my enemies, but into the hands of God. 70,000 people died throughout the land in three days. I don't think we understand how significant this is. Now, when we read of wild beasts, we think, well, that can't happen. I mean, wild animals are either, that could hurt us, are either extinct or they're in captivity. However, some have pointed out that in populated cities, rats exists to this day that carry disease. And in a time like this, it's possible that the rats could multiply. We know that they caused about a quarter of Europe to be depopulated during the bubonic plague, carrying poison. Now, whether that's the case or not, I don't know. But I will point out one other thing that's worth pointing out. This term, wild beasts, isn't limited to larger animals. The word is actually an interesting word, so when you read it, don't just think lions and tigers and bears, oh my. In fact, in 1890, James Strong, he's the one who spent 20 years of his life to give us the exhaustive concordance. It's exhaustive just to carry the thing, but uh, James Strong produced the concordance of the Bible. We went through and recorded every word, and every word that it came from in the Greek and the Hebrew, so you don't even have to know Greek and Hebrew to, to study those things. He suggested this Greek word used in our text, therion, should be interpreted as, quote, tiny, uncontrolled, poisonous beasts. It's a word that's diminutive, which means it's something small. Now, I'm not sure, but it sounds a lot like a microscopic pandemic to me. I, I'm not going to be dogmatic. I'm, I'm not a dog. I'm just a sheep. But at the same time, fascinating that the prediction is of a worldwide death count that is horrific, and God's going to use this small, poisonous thing that's alive. And I wonder sometimes if we won't see greater destruction than we've even imagined. Now, I want to take some applications in our time, because I think the most important thing is not just to understand what it's talking about in the future, but Lord, what should be my reaction to this as I study it? So here's the first one. Be careful when you study prophecy, not cocky. Be careful, not cocky. Why? We need to remember that prophecy becomes crystal clear as to what it means when it's fulfilled. In the rear view mirror, we come to fully and clearly understand. And we need to be very humble about interpreting it and saying, this means that. Be very careful about that. We can learn a lot, but we need to be careful about the specific details. For instance, there are those who differ with us on the interpretation of the book of Revelation. They say it's already happened. It's already been uh, fulfilled during the 70, uh, in 70 AD when Rome came down and destroyed uh, uh, Jerusalem. Uh, there are those who wonder if the bow uh, in our text uh, that is being carried by the man on the white horse is in a rainbow because the word could be used for either. So there are varieties of interpretations, and clearly we don't believe they're all accurate. We can simply say as best we can, here's what we think is correct, but we need to stay humble about it. In fact, it's interesting to me to bring this point up because I love the fact that John, remember, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. Many of you know this S-Y-N in our language comes from the Greek word S-U-N, soon, which means together. Optic uh, means optimi in Greek means to look. They are looking at together the same events for the most part. Matthew, Mark, and Luke going over mostly the same events. John, writing many years later, writes his gospel. And he fills in a lot of details that Matthew, Mark, and Luke did not 
He's no, he knows their Gospels by then, and he was there being an eyewitness. But writing toward the end of the first century, those guys are gone. I tell you that to say this. It's interesting to me to read John and what he has to say about some of the things that Matthew, Mark, and Luke said. For instance, we all know on Palm Sunday, Jesus said to his disciples, go into the village opposite you and you'll find a donkey tied up, release him, bring him to me. And so they did that. And Jesus comes into Jerusalem and the people are quoting Messianic Psalm, Psalm 118, save now he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the gospel writers mention that Jesus was fulfilling Zechariah, where Zechariah says, Rejoice, daughter of Jerusalem, your king is coming to you, humble, riding on a donkey, even a foal of a donkey. In other words, they point out, hey, he fulfilled the prophecies being the Messiah. John is the only one who says, but by the way, he doesn't say it like that, but that's how I feel. By the way, we didn't know that he was fulfilling that prophecy until after he rose from the dead. And then we realized that's what he was doing. In other words, we didn't get it at the time. It wasn't like, get the donkey, it's Zechariah. They didn't know that. They didn't, right, get him a donkey. I don't know, he wants to ride a donkey. Clueless until after it was over that he was fulfilling prophecy. Same thing about destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. John said the same thing. We didn't realize that he was really talking about his resurrection until after he rose from the dead when he said that. John's just being honest. Jeremiah is sitting in a dungeon because he's telling the king, you're going to Babylon, and the king doesn't like to hear that because God's pronouncing judgment on the kingdom of Judah. So Jeremiah sitting there in the dungeon, and he says, the word of the Lord came to me saying that my cousin son of my uncle is going to come and offer me some land by a field. Now you got to understand, the, the Babylonians are coming. Land is going to be like worth a zero. <laughs> Nobody wants to invest. Everything is going to be owned by somebody else. So what's the point, right? But God says, I, I want you to buy the land. See, this, is your, this is your expression of faith that I'm not done with Israel. You buy that land that's about to be worthless, Jeremiah. Your cousin's going to come and he's going to offer you some land. He wants to get out from under it, get some money. You buy it. Jeremiah then says, and, and then, then he came. My cousin came to me and he offered me the land and, 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 and I bought. He goes, and then he says, and then I knew it was the word of the Lord. <laughs> After what I thought was the word of the Lord happened, then I knew it. Do, do you understand the point? The point is, most of the time, real clarity as to exactly what the prophecy is, is in retrospect. So stay humble. <laughs> Satan wants to divide the body of Christ about it. The 144,000, are they the Jews and Gentiles? Or are they? No end of opinions about many interpretive issues. We don't want to divide. We want to say, Lord, what are you trying to tell us that we can take to the heart and take to the bank? You know, um, knowing the future can be super encouraging or it can be dangerously divisive. Uh, there's an old episode of Twilight Zone where these husband and wife break into a curio shop and they steal some stuff. They think there's some value to it. There's nothing of any real value there. But there's this camera episode is called the most unusual camera because this camera which turns out to be a Polaroid type camera takes a picture and then what you thought you took a picture of is not what comes out it's about five minutes in the future how many of you remember this the rest of you go watch it it's it's <laughs> worth watching and so what do they do? They go, wait, when they figure it out, they go down to the racetrack. That's where everybody would go. And they're taking pictures of the finish line before the race starts, and they're betting on it. They're making all this money. It's great. As the episode goes on, you start to see what this knowing the future does as they start seeing evil desires in each other and suspicions of stealing. And they wind up all being dead. Sorry, I just ruined the movie. Don't even bother watching. I just ruined it for you. See, God wants you to know the future for his purposes. Satan says, okay, God tell them the future, but I'll use it to divide them, to argue with each other. Christians can argue just about 
anything. I like that guy who said, you know, I have my favorite football team, and there are some times when they're playing and I can't watch the game, so I'll, I'll record it. And then I'll go home and I'll want to watch the game to see how it, how it went. He says, I already know who won because I already heard, you know. But I still watch the game because I have certain players I want to watch. And he says, but when that happens, I already know our team wins. But he says, I watch the game, but he goes, but it doesn't bother me when we fumble the ball. It doesn't bother me when we're behind a few. It doesn't bother me if we're way behind because I already know how it ends. That's the encouragement of knowing the future from the scriptures. Lord, I don't see it right now. I don't understand how this fits in. I, I, it feels like we're losing, but I've read the end of the book. I know I can celebrate the fact we have victory in Jesus Christ. We're going home. You're coming back. These things are written in black and white, and I'm comforted by your commitment. Put this down. Be comforted by considering what's coming. Sometimes people will ask me, Pastor Bob, do you believe we will live to see the events of the Great Tribulation? And I say, absolutely. Absolutely. You say, really? Yes, right here. In the text. You're alive, aren't you? See, what the Lord wants us to do is to see the events of the Great Tribulation and then have that change our perspective on our lives right now. We need to remember where we will be. The Bible says we're seated with Christ in the heavenlies. I think we forget where we are. Colossians 3 and verse 1. Colossians 3 and verse 1. If you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Here's what it says in Ephesians. You were dead, but God raised you up together with Christ and seated you with Christ in the heavenly. We need to see ourselves there. John is there. John sees the events of what's going on on the earth from heaven. We will see it. Sometimes people say, well, in heaven, can you see what's going on on the earth? I guess so. John's watching what's happening down on the earth. I think we forget where, where we are and where we're going to be. I came out of Home Depot a few months ago, walked to my car, started to get into my car, only to see some guy was in my car. Before my police instincts could kick in, the look on his face told me maybe that wasn't my car. <laughs> and sure enough, one just like my car, oh, it was my car, was two more down. And as I was trying to get into his car, he was pretty upset about that. <laughs> but then he looked at me like, been there, done that. Because <laughs> half of Orange County owns white Teslas. <laughs> Have you forgotten where God says you're going to be parked during the Great Tribulation? You're going to be in heaven. You're going to be in a very safe place. Listen, is this passage heavy? Of course it's heavy. Is it to be, oh good, I'm not, I'm not going to be around for that? No. It's not that it should not affect us in terms of our unsaved loved ones. The people that you work with, the people that you're neighbors to who are not, they have no assurance of being in heaven at all. You know, it's interesting to me how often Jesus describes with the great tribulation like a woman who's going into labor. You know, labor pains increase in intensity and frequency the closer you get to the birth. And these signs, Jesus said, will increase in intensity and frequency like a woman going into labor. John 16 and verse 21, Jesus said, whenever a woman is in travail, she has sorrow because her hour has come, but when she gives birth to the child, she remembers the anguish no more. I know it just seems like everything that happens that's related to any of the signs that Jesus said will precede the Great Tribulation, we, we, people think, well, there's an earthquake in the middle of the night. Is that biblical? I don't know that it is. Well, they have this chip, and they're chipping people, and I won't take it because it's, you know, it's the mark of the beast. Um, don't take it, but don't 
try to drag the future into the present. There are things that are going to happen in the future in the book of Revelation that have nothing to do with what's going on right now. And I think it's important that you understand that. Look, before a woman goes into labor, quite often she has something called Braxton Hicks contractions. How many of you have ever heard of those? Okay. They're referred to as false labor. They're not the time to give birth. So you say, oh, so some of these things, they really are real of it. No, no. Braxton Hicks don't happen to women that aren't pregnant. <laughs> they happen to pregnant women. Sometimes they're called practice labor. I don't know that you have to practice, but... They mean it's not right this second, but it is coming soon. We need to see the correlation of so many of the things in technology and geopolitical events that's telling us it's coming. No, that one is not the one in the book of Revelation in the Great Tribulation. But the fact that the technology is here, the fact that there's alignment of these nations, even as we speak, should open our eyes. Jesus said, when you see all these things begin to happen, get shook up. No, he said, look up for your redemption draws nigh. Now look, we don't rejoice in tragedy, but we should behold the trajectory of history and prophecy and what's going on in our world. Death and Hades come together. The Bible speaks of three types of death. There's physical death. We're all familiar with that. That's the separation of the body and the spirit. Just as the body without the spirit is dead, so is faith without works. There is spiritual death that's being separated from God and every person on this planet, including you and everybody you know, is born spiritually dead. If you have never been made alive by Christ, you're still dead. Sorry, I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm just trying to be honest. You don't know you're dead. In fact, can I tell you something? If you're a Christian, you don't need a sixth sense to go around and say, I see dead people. They're all over the place. Just read your Bible. But there is also something called eternal death, or the second death. That's eternal separation from God. Jesus said, don't fear him who can kill the body, but cannot hurt the soul. But fear him who can cast body and soul into hell. Death is fearful. That's why Jesus came to die, to take the sting out of death. That's Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Death is fearful, but folks, Hades is forever. It's way beyond just physical death. And Jesus shows up in the book of Revelation. John falls as a dead man before him. And he says, I was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. Regarding death and Hades, John, don't fear because I got the keys to both. <laughs> I am the answer to your fear of death. And I am the answer to eternal death. You don't have to fear ever being separated from God. Final thing, and I know it's the time to be final, but it's not even on your outline. Some of you went, I'm done, put it away. Pull it back out and write these words down. Then you can put it away. Be committed to your calling. Be committed to your calling. Why do I say that? Because as we study the church in heaven and these horrific things coming down to the earth, the worship team can come. Um, and I say this in part for our church uniquely. As a pastor, I am delighted to worship God with you. I love worship. I love our worship. We, in chapter 5, when the church is in heaven, <laughs> see the church occupied with adoration of God. It's all about worship. And we ought to worship our God. We need to worship our God. But listen to me. When you see the church on earth, that's the book of Acts. They are not consumed with adoration. They're consumed with communication of the gospel. Amen. And Satan would love to take worship and make it an end in itself for the church. As though we're already in heaven. Just occupy yourself with that. And who cares about a lost world? But as we see the church on earth, it realizes that until they meet my Savior, until I tell them about Jesus, I have not fulfilled my commission. Because they're not ready. I'm ready to go at a second. Of the Lord, call me home. Trumpet sound. I want to go now. I want to go today. Thy kingdom come and I want to go. That's great. 
But you need to make, and I need to make my commitment, not only to worship the God who has forgiven me, but to bring people with us who are not ready. The church on earth has a commission. Yes, to worship, but not only to worship. Not to be so consumed with worship that we forget that there's a call to tell people that Jesus is coming and they're not ready. Amen? Amen. Let's stand and sing together. given us your plan, these prophecies, these promises that give us courage and confidence and hope. Lord, we thank you that we are going to be taken to heaven and it could happen today, it could happen at any time. Lord, we want to be ready for that. We worship you as the living God. We want to see you on the throne, not just of world events, but our own lives today. Thank you for the peace that that brings us. But Lord, we don't want to just worship you and look forward to the kingdom we want to be occupied with witness on this earth. Would you help us to think of those who are not ready, who have not yet repented, who have not met or not received our Savior, and go tell them, Lord, might be our last chance. Thank you that you're coming. We pray you'd come. Get us ready in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.